At a time where everything has gone virtual, Lake International Pan-African Film Festival 6th edition takes you there. From 3rd to the 6th of November, we take you there to experience humanity through workshops, panel discussions, open forums, screenings and a gala award. Come and experience this year's festival online. Lake International Pan-African Film Festival 6th Edition Disrupt the Narrative Uh -huh. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the sixth edition of the Lake International Pan-African Film Festival. This is our second day of the festival, and we are very, very, very excited. Last year, we had a panel discussion on producing children content. Today, we are going to have another exciting discussion on film and human rights issues for human rights education. And tomorrow, we are going to have another panel discussion on documenting African history. We also have workshops. Today, we had a workshop on film pitching and tomorrow we still have another one on writing a film fundraising proposal you realize we have so many grants all over but how do we get them so that's what we are all about this year so i'll just hand over to the panel for this day and uh, our moderator vigilance atieno will introduce the guest and let's have a lovely time as we learn how to use film for advocacy film for human rights education and just film for entertainment while looking at our human rights. Because, I mean, it's a human right, then it's a right for life. Thank you so, so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Zipporah Koth, for that beautiful introduction. Our panel discussion for today is films and human rights. And with us, we have lovely guests who are going to just discuss with us, share their thoughts and opinions about this particular topic. I'm your moderator, and my name is Vigilance Atieno. I'm a filmmaker and also a co-founder of La Femme Garnier Initiative, an initiative that aims to build on women's sustainability and development. So right before I let my guests introduce themselves, I'm just going to do a brief introduction of each and every panelist for this particular session. And I thank everyone who is joining us on Facebook and YouTube. So with us today, we have... Dr. Felipe Talavera, he's from Namibia. He's the director and producer of Oyo Trust. We also have Sifu Mbata, he's from South Africa and he's the CEO of Favor Media. It's a production company in South Africa and he's going to tell us more about it. We also have Jen Waidera, she's from Kenya and she's the founder of Positive Exposure Kenya. We are going to be joined with Mr. Irungu Huton who is the executive director of Amnesty International Kenya. So I'll start with Dr. Felipe Salavera. You're going to give us an introduction and just tell us what Oyo Trust is all about. And then when you finish, Jen Waidera will follow and then Sifu Mbata in that particular order. So Mr. Felipe, it's your time. Thank you very much. Um, first apology, I've got a bad, a bad flu. So my voice is a bit all over the place, but I hope you can still hear me. Uh, yes. So yeah, as mentioned, my name is Philip, and I'm from Namibia. Um, the Oyo Trust is a Namibian NGO, and the idea of the NGO is to use art to create social awareness. So we use different forms of art. Film is one medium. We also use dance, theater, exhibitions, and we talk about all sorts of social issues. Um, issues ranging from HIV and teenage pregnancy to GBV but also um, human rights, especially when human rights uh, are um, not respected. Uh, as part of the Lake International Film Festival, we are privileged to have one of our film in, in the competition, um, Capana. And Capana is specifically looking at the right of the LGBTQI plus community. In Namibia, like in many African countries, um, sodomy is still a crime. So to be gay, um, especially to be gay, is uh, a crime. So we are trying to discuss um, what to do to decriminalize same-sex relationship. And the film is one of the media we are using to uh, promote discussions. But in a nutshell, that's what we try to do to, to promote discussion and conversation around difficult topics. 
thank you so much, Dr. Felipe. We are going to pick up on a variety of things that you've shared. I'll give Jen Waidera the opportunity to introduce herself and tell us what Positive Exposure Kenya is all about. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jen Waidera, and I have albinism, just so that all of us are on the same page. And because I have albinism, and I know most of us who've grown up in Africa all have heard about what happens to people with albinism in this continent, is that you're seen as outcasts, and there's a lot of negativity that comes with just a child being born with albinism. And because of that experience, like my experience as a child growing up as the only one in our whole neighborhood with albinism, I knew I looked different and not in a good way because, of course, I was bullied a lot. There was a lot of teasing. And the reason behind Positive Exposure, which I founded in 2010, was really to expose albinism in a positive way. And by further doing, like, of course, exposing diversity as part of human diversity, I mean, being different as something positive. So we are all about advocacy. We are all about uh, uh, education. And we are all about using creative media to change perceptions and attitudes that surround persons with albinism and broadly persons who are different. Thank you. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, Madam Jane Waidera. I'll give this opportunity to Sifu Mbata all the way from South Africa to tell us more about himself. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yes. Yes, yes. Um, I, I couldn't hear uh, Jane uh, properly uh, when she was doing an introduction. Um, so, so my name is Sifu Mbata, and I'm a filmmaker from uh, South Africa. Um, I run a film production company uh, called Favor Media. I'm actually in, in Nairobi now attending the, the film festival. Um, so Favor Media, it's, it's um, a film production company that is based in South Africa. What we do is we do feature films, uh, we do short films, we do documentaries. Um, our feature films that we've, we've done, um, you know, they play um, on, on DSTV, um, on a channel called Nzanze Magic in, in South Africa. So pretty much all we do is we, we shoot movies and yeah, our one of our feature films called Gola 2 um, is going to be playing actually on in, in the festival. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. So pretty much that's what I do. Um, I run a film production company and then I write, I direct, I produce as well, yeah. Uh, thank you so much to my lovely panelists for the beautiful introductions you've given. And I think as we are preparing for this particular discussion, it's very good to know that each and every panel member here in one way or another has used film as a media for arts and advocacy. And so it's it's very easy for us now to have a discussion centered on this, particularly understanding films and human rights. And just to give a brief introduction to our listeners whenever they are is that human rights are fundamental rights to everyone right to eat right to be protected right to be treated with dignity and over the past couple of decades particularly in africa we've seen governments trying to violate these rights in society we've seen an increased violation and nobody's talking about it and also we have to recognize that there is the power of film and there's the power of media in terms of trying to create awareness trying to expose such violations. And so I'll write jump into you, Mr. Sifu Mbata. Having looked at your profile, particularly Favor Media, you're very eloquent when you say that Favor Media does not only shoot for entertainment, but you shoot for art for advocacy. As a filmmaker, what inspires you to actually now decide I'm not only going to do these things for entertainment, but I'm going to do these things so that I can change the perception of society. And even looking at the kind of film that you submitted for the festival, it's called Zola, where there's this guy, he comes all the way from the United States and realizes high rate of corruption, uh, the issue of drug and substance abuse, and he works as an individual to change uh, such narrative. So what do you have to say that inspires you as a filmmaker? Um, thank, th thank you so much um, mm -hmm. for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak about this. Um, so, so the movie that I submitted, it's called uh, it's called Gola Two, um, and then Gola it's it's a it's a it's a Zulu word which means uh, forgive. Mm -hmm. 
So the, the movie that I submitted is, is part two of the movie. So in part one of the movie, um, we, we, we meet a, a boy, uh, Kola, um, who was born with no arms. So um, he was born with a disability, disability called focomelia. Um, you know, which is an absence of, of, of limbs. So he died, he was born with no arms. And then in part one of the movie, his dream is to become a photographer. And then um, eventually he gets um, a bursary and then he goes to the United States to study uh, filmmaking. And then in part two, we see him coming back from the US. And then when he comes back in the community, he discovers that there's a problem, you know, of, of, of substance abuse especially drugs you know within the youth and then um you know he wants to stop you know this drug problem that's happening in his community and then he discovers that the mayor is actually the one who's supplying drugs within uh, the community and then he exposes the mayor and then um the reason why i decided to to cast uh, someone with a disability you know as the lead actor um you know someone who doesn't have arms is because i really wanted to educate people about disability that it doesn't mean that if you have a disability, you can't do anything, you know? And when we also look at the movie, you know, the movie is not really focused on disability. It's not focused on, you know, the, the lead character that he doesn't have arms. When you watch the movie, actually you get to forget, you forget that this, pers this person doesn't have arms because we, we're not focused on that. And the reason why I also went towards that route is because I didn't want to, 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 to bring shame in the movie. I didn't want when people watch the movie, they have, you know, um, you know, sympathy for, 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 for the lead character. I wanted when people watch the movie, they see him as a normal person, you know. Um, so I just wanted to educate people about disability that it doesn't mean that when you have a disability, you can't uh, do anything, you know, you can't, um, you know, act in the movie or you can't solve a problem, you know, which is happening in your community. So I just wanted to inspire many people as well who have disabilities, who have given up, you know, you know, in life, you know, they think that they can't do anything. I wanted to show them that it doesn't mean that if you have a certain disability, you can't uh, achieve anything or you can't go anywhere. So it was mainly me educating, um, you know, people about disability. And um, on, on my side, I, I don't have uh, any disability, but uh, growing up, I come from, from a Christian, um, you know, home. So, you know, I was taught love at an early age that you have to love and accept people, you know, the way they are. So, yeah, you know, throughout my journey of filmmaking, I've always wanted to do something that can also, you know, speak, you know, to, 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 to other audiences. So that's why I decided to do, uh, you know, Paula and, you know, make the lead actor to be someone with a disability. And okay. yeah, you know, yes. Thank you so much, Sifiwe. Before we continue our discussion, I would love to welcome Mr. Irungu Huton, the Executive Director of Amnesty International Kenya. So I'll give him a moment to just tell us what he does and what uh, his work entails, and then we'll proceed from there. Welcome, Sana, Mr. Irungu. Thank you very much, Vigilance, and uh, good afternoon or good evening or good morning, everybody. Um, uh, as you um, gave me that um, introduction, I was uh, going to resist the temptation to tell you what I do, but really tell you what I am so excited about uh, at this moment. I mean, I think this is such a wonderful time um, to be a lover of films and to be a lover of human rights. And uh, for some of us, we have those two really collapsed. Um, not that we don't uh, watch movies that are not about human rights, but really the the tenacity, the resilience of humanity um, as it comes up against discrimination, as it comes up against violence, or as it comes up against exclusion, um, is nowhere you know best um, uh, expressed than in film, right? Um, and I just a couple of initial uh, reflections. Uh, just uh, you know, fourth uh, of November. Um, 2021. I mean, I, I think, you know, um, I mean, three things. I think one is that um, there is obviously um, a number of movies that we could talk about or series that we could talk about that are really um, propaganda in, in, their, in their orientation. They're, they caricature humanity in, in order to make a political statement or to make a, um, a statement about human rights and its importance. And uh, there are movies like that, right? And I'm not going to concentrate on those films. They have their place 
Um, but what I would like to concentrate a little bit on is really the, um, the movies that bring out the complexity um, of the ecosystem within which humanity navigates issues of dignity, issues of safety, and issues of, uh, uh, of, of leadership and visibility. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very present to the fact that, you know, Kenya has not done so badly. Um, we have a number of great movies and... Um, you know, vigilance and uh, and and Sipiwe, Africa in terms of uh, focus. There are a number of um, wonderful movies that we could pick on that would would focus on this. Whether it be you know uh, Nairobi Half Life, one of the first um, movies that really exposed the dangers of a flawed criminal justice system um, or a justice system that enabled extrajudicial killings and police brutality many, many years ago. I mean, this could be even 10 years ago, right? Um, issues that Amnesty International Kenya is still working on with our partners now. Or whether it be issues of, um, you know, anti-discrimination um, or discrimination, like the uh, recently released I Am Samuel, an excellent movie that talks about the complexity and the uh, injustices that um, LGBTIQ persons experience. Um, and of course, it comes on the back of Rafiki. Or all the wonderful movie, um, you know, that has come out uh, that chrono uh, chronologues um, the life of uh, Boniface Mwangi, um, uh, really a movie about active citizenship or a documentary, I think more of a, it's not so much uh, fictional, um, but really looking at what is it like to be an active citizen and to seek political office in a context in which the stage uh, for elections is completely rigged against uh, people who don't have uh, multi-million shillings to run uh, to serve uh, the public. So I think these are some of the um, you know, I, things that we need to discuss this afternoon, and I'm sure I'll get another chance. So let me just stop at this point and just say what a wonderful time to be a lover of films and to be a lover of human rights. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Irungu, for that uh, detailed uh, introduction that you've given unto us and just giving us insights and light into what we wanted to discuss this particular time. I would love just to pick up something that you've said in terms of making films more uh, agenda-driven, in terms of trying to fight for rights for individuals and protecting dignity and everything like that. Uh, there's a lot of statistics that have been carried out and there's a disconnect between the NGO world and the reflections that people perceive from them. If you if you walk around, the way people talk about NGO is that most of the time they want to focus on the bad side of things. Uh, most of the time, the images that they use do not actually what reflect the current uh, ecosystem that is going on around. Maybe Mr. Uh, Dr. Fil Felipe from Namibia, you can just speak on that, on that because you have an NGO that deals with addressing uh, social advocacy and issues dealing with rights and dignity. What can NGOs do to ensure that there is a connection between the storytelling and the creative element of it? It's hmm, a big question. Uh, <coughs> but I think, I think you're right, but I think it's not only the NGO world. I think if you take even the movie world, we tend uh, to portray a lot of negative stories. Somehow dramas have a better standing than comedies or love stories or romance. And when we talk about human rights and when we have human rights themes, very often they also look at the bad. Um, and they don't necessarily look at the reality and um, the positive. Um, I can echo with, uh, with um, what you said earlier about I Am Samuel and other LGBTQI plus film. Um, a lot of the um, reality on the ground is that being gay or lesbian in Africa is difficult. Um, you can be kicked out of your house by your family. You can be um, discriminated against. The police can uh, assault you. That's that's the reality. That's true. Uh, but if we reiterate this message in film, uh, we also give representation to that reality. And we don't necessarily give an opportunity for change. We don't necessarily look at the other side of the picture. And I think it's important, whether it is with the NGO or whether it is with the film, that we look at both sides of the coin. That yes, there is some drama, but there can also be some resilience and some uh, positive stories. And whether it is newspaper or people are not interested in positive stories, but we have to make them interested in positive stories. And representation matters. And if you take again the same example of a 
young gay man anywhere in Kenya, in Namibia, um, looking for the first time at a gay movie, what do you want him to see? A negative story where he's being prosecuted by the police, chased away by the family, or a love story where he can think, okay, I, I too can love and I too can, can be loved. So I think it's important to remember that representation matters. And as much as it is important to show the shortcomings and to discuss the problems, it's also important to look at the other side of the coin and to give a little bit of hope um, to various people who are watching the movies as well. Uh, thank you so much. And just to get to Mr. Irungu, uh, we've had uh, Dr. Felipe talking about the the aspect of giving people hope through films. And we've seen Amnesty International as an organization on its own. Amnesty is always there when there's any injustices, when there's any violation by the government or any institution, Amnesty is always there. How then can Amnesty as an organization ensure that there is right documentation of such uh, occurrences? particularly in terms of trying to document them, not only for the present generation, but even for the next generation. Yeah. So I, I just love the way that uh, Philippe um, framed that. I mean, I think um, I, I come from a, a, a you know, a frame of mind, um, which I think is, is very much kind of how Amnesty is operating, which is that we have to take, we have to take sides on injustice. We have to take sides on discrimination. We have to take sides on exclusion of human beings, that all human beings are created equal. They have um, levels of uh, human rights that are consistent with the fact that they are part of humanity. And it, that is not taken away either by their sexuality, by their, their color, their, um, their genetic makeup, um, uh, their class or their geographical location. So that's, that's the starting point. But I think it's really important um, for filmmakers and even for activists really to understand that while you take that side, the world is complex. There is no binary in the world out there. Um, the people that hold the positions that um, mob violence is a reasonable response to a flawed criminal justice system, they too need to be engaged by our work, right? We cannot dismiss them. Um, the homophobic people in our communities, we need to engage them, right? We cannot dismiss homophobia just because we don't like it. Um, that would be the, the same as essentially dismissing, you know, uh, uh, people different sexual sexuality choices from us. So I think, you know, that that's the essence of human rights. It is a belief that all human beings are created equal and must be treated equally. Um, so I, you know, I have an intense interest and curiosity with police officers, right? Um, I spend, you know, as Amnesty, our job is to, to catch bad police officers who hurt people um, using excessive force. That's our job, my job, that's my job. I, you know, I tell this to the Inspector General and the National Police Service. If there's a job description, that's my job description. However, I am completely interested and curious about how the culture of violence can be rooted out from the police service and how can Amnesty in doing that keep as many police officers out of our jails as possible. Right. Um, so we're not in a punitive, um, let's go get them. We are in really a redemptive, transformative conversation around human rights. And I think that's the, the excitement um, that I think filmmakers or the opportunity that um, the exciting opportunity that, that uh, filmmakers have, which is to make movies with complexity, right? Make movies where there is there, there are you know disagreements. There is the, the, the full facet, the full stories that all the narratives allowed to be represented and but uh, you know like philip is you know i've watched so many movies where the ending just leaves me feeling paralyzed it leaves me feeling hopeless i don't like those kind of music movies because my life is not my purpose is not to 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 agonize my purpose is to organize yeah, thank you so much. I, I like the way you end it. Your purpose is to organize. Jen Wedera, during your introduction, you talked about your personal experience pushing you into the world of advocacy, particularly being someone with albinism and the way the society views the albinism group. Uh, in terms of trying to tell people and educate the public, which kind of medium do you uh, use in terms of trying to tell people, you know what, this is what albinism is all about. These are the challenges. We're just human beings who deserve equal rights as you people. So as an organization, we utilize different media and mm -hmm. one of course, because all of us are talking about films is that we utilize 
educational documentaries and short films to raise awareness on albinism and not only raise awareness on albinism but also to start the conversation so there's one educational documentary we did in 2010 actually just as we were starting called on beauty and it's in the theaters it's been there for the last 10 years but it, it captures the stories of different persons with disabilities, actually, me included. And one of the things in everywhere we screen this short documentary, the students come out and can identify with their different experiences. Like they may be discriminated in their different contexts, but this whole documentary starts that conversation. And I think it's also good that we ourselves are speaking about our own experiences and just not using those experiences to, to seek sympathy, but rather to like show it from the positive side. And I also like a lot how Felipe has been has put a person with a disability like as a main character, but the the, the film is actually not about the disability, but something different. And I think that's where I would wish like we start normalizing uh, characters in our films, including diverse characters, including persons with disabilities, because then that way you're able to like normalize it. If you think of all the movies that you know, I think, especially with albinism, the villain is always the person with albinism. And imagine this supernatural person, and we already believe these people are supernatural. So having, changing just the way we even present persons with albinism and persons with disabilities in general in movies and the Documentaries can go a long way in also pushing for better understanding and better awareness. So besides film, we also utilize photography. I think you also see some trends behind on my screen. So we do like more photo exhibitions, and because like we believe in more visual, and because like our condition is so visibly invisible in this continent, like we are so visible, but our needs and and the challenges that we encounter have really not been addressed. So we try to use a lot of photography and uh, of course, positive imaging of people with albinism. And we of course never use the blinds on the eyes because we try to humanize conditions and try to humanize people besides thinking about their impairment. So we use photography and further to that, we've also been trying to use uh, street, street theaters and street plays where you just, have like short skits around awareness and advocacy and even like competitions for awareness. Just try to think around very different diverse ways of raising awareness. And this applies to whether we are dealing with school going children, like the ones in primary schools, we use a different media to when you're talking to an audience that really understands this. And maybe even on a higher level, then we use like documentaries, people who can actually comprehend and see the lessons. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that, Jen Waidera. Before we continue the discussion, I would just love to read some of the comments coming in on our social media platform, that is Facebook and YouTube. We have people saying this is a brilliant uh, conversation. It is a timely discussion. And then we have people, uh, someone on YouTube saying such a timely discussion, especially when a number of people are suffering from mental health issues, which are caused by among reasons of discrimination and social pressure. We also have someone on Facebook saying solid perspective by Irungu on inclusivity in all films. And then someone saying, interesting, actually bad stories are great. Tragedy is more involving intellectually than comedy. And then the last comment I'll read is from Rachel Wainaina saying great discussion following. If you're joining us now on Facebook or YouTube, today we are talking about films and human rights. And with us in our panel discussion, we have Mr. Irungu Hutton, the executive director of Amnesty International Kenya. We have Sifu Mbata, who is the CEO of Fever Media all the way from South Africa. We have Jen Waidera, who is the founder of Positive Exposure Kenya. And we have Dr. Felipe Talavera, who is the director and producer of Oil Trust Fund. So as we continue this particular discussion, I would love to pick up on something that one of our audience has said, where she says, actually, bad stories are great. Tragedy is more intellectually involving than comedy. Uh, Sifue, as a filmmaker, what's your thought on that? Okay, can, can you please repeat the, the statement? Uh, we have Dr. Rachel Dianga saying, interesting 
actually bad stories are great tragedy is more involving intellectually than comedy you remember uh previously we've had a discussion where we we're saying in as much as we're trying to tell stories instead of only focusing on the bad side of the stories let us also do stories that give people hope but here we have someone saying bad stories are great <laughs> yeah I, I i i think i would first um want to ask this question like what what are bad stories when we say because i believe um when it comes to art really mm -hmm. there's nothing you know bad you know because you know there are different types of genres i mean there's your experimental movies you know which is a movie when maybe you 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 watch the format you know, and the, the way it's told, it won't be like your normal stories. Maybe they will start maybe with the with, with the ending or maybe with the, you know, the, the, the story. It's not like your regular story, your normal three structure, which you know, you know, the beginning, middle and end. So I would say, I don't really believe that they are the bad stories. Uh, it's the mm -hmm. same as art, you know. Um, I can't see a painting and then say, you know, that's a bad painting even if it's just maybe one line that the artist has made, you know, maybe the artist, you know, is, is saying a message, you know, just by that one line, you know? So I think what storytelling is the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. It's really about the, the, the genre, you know? So if it's, it's, it's a comedy and the, the storyteller is stuck to those comedy elements, then, you know, uh, you know, it's a story well told, you know, if it's a horror. So <laughs> and, um, my question would be, what is a bad story? Uh, so I don't really believe there's may maybe a story maybe might not be shot well uh, mm -hmm. or maybe I don't know, maybe it might not be written well. But it's, it's really hard to say, you know, if something is really a bad a bad story <laughs> you know yeah yeah i, I think uh, just uh, just a thought on this i think when they say bad stories i remember there was a discussion yesterday when they're talking about producing uh, children content and one of the panelists said over the years over time in memorial every time when they do a story in africa for instance they'll always show the dirty child there is no moment for a film to sell. They never show this child who is just in a safe home with a happy family. Most of the time, it's this chaotic environment. The child is struggling. The child is doing what? Or even in when they shoot Nairobi, most of the time, they that rare films where you see them shooting Nairobi, the lavish and luxurious estates like Arid or Runda, they'll always go to Kibra or maybe Madare. But the question will be also: Is those are those are the are, are those places where? such stories can be found or is it just the way they want to reflect africa maybe dr felipe you can jump in i've just two part to that answer one is maybe a little bit um um i don't know um if you look at the oscars if you look at the big um the big international awards they do tend to award more tragedies than mm -hmm. comedies uh, and there is a little bit of this belief that it is harder for an actor, for an actress, or director to portray a very negative story than it is to just be happy and portray an easy story. So I think there is that component that internationally, um, tragedy has got more value and is more often recognized as, as more challenging for um, the people involved. But maybe for the viewer, there will also uh, this side that if you look at someone else's life being worse than you, then you think, oh, good, then my life is not so bad <laughs> after all. So maybe there is also a little bit of this component that we like those tragedy. <coughs> Sorry. Because they remind us that uh, life could be worse. Um, but tragedy do happen, unfortunately. There's a lot of tragedy all over the world, including in Africa. Um, it's important to document tragedy, it's important to learn from those tragedies. But um, if we want to move forward, um, do we want to be talking about the same thing in 20 years? Do we want to have the same issues in 20 years? Or do you want to have been able to evolve, move forward? And in order to evolve and move forward, what do we need? We also need to embrace um, hope, comedy, romance, um, we need to embrace uh, stories like, I like what you have um, said as well, where disability is just normal and you forget that the character in the movie has disability. Um, a little bit like when we did Kapana, 
uh, it, it's a story of two men in love in Namibia. And uh, at the end of the day, people forget there are two men uh, and it, they just want them to be together. And that's what we want, that people forget uh, about the physical ability, the sexuality, everything of the characters, and they just focus on the humanity of those characters. But in order to focus on the humanity of the character, you need to give the story a little bit of hope if you just dwell in the negative. Um, yes, it's appealing. Yes, it's an actor's challenge. Um, but what does it bring in terms of discussion? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just to jump into uh, Mr. Irungu, we see you doing a very good job in terms of trying to be in the front line when it comes to supporting uh, films that advocate for human rights. And this is very evident with uh, Lake International pan Africa, where there is a segment of the Amnesty International uh, uh, film competition for students to just highlight in regards to some of the human rights violations. And if you look at this year's festival, there's a lot of issue ab about police brutality, uh, gender-based violence, injustices, and high level of corruption. How well then can Amnesty use the documented films in terms of moving the agenda forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I should say that really, you know, filmmaking is very much embedded in Amnesty International Kenya, whether it be, um, you know, James Kimila, uh, uh, Amy Ocheng, the colleagues that I work with, or whether it be on our board with Kevin Wachiro, who has a background as a BBC journalist. You know, we, we, we are completely convinced that um, movies, film are a very powerful way of um, allowing nations to be able to find themselves, to be able to uh, see themselves and to be able to chart new futures for themselves. And I think that that will always be the case for us. Uh, I would hate that one day that we would turn our back on the creative industry. I think there are a couple of thoughts that I had. Uh, one is, um, you know, this comment about it's only bad news that sells. And uh, I think it's in some ways we're not newspapers. Um, and I actually argue that even with newspapers when, and with um, television uh, news stories, um, it's not just the bad stories, the injustices, the horror, the, the, the darkness. It is also the light and the hope. But what good movie uh, making really provides is this idea of attention, right? That there is something to play for. There is something that uh, the protagonist is up against. Um, there is a triumph. You know, that's what I think human, human beings love to see in, in movies. That's what I love to see in movies. And, and let me just be clear, you know, Runda, um, Mthaiga, um, and I'm not sure what the equivalent is in uh, Windhoek, but um, uh, the, you know, the upper class uh, neighborhoods, they have their stories too, right? Um, this is the thing that, uh, you know, I, I have it. It doesn't have to be a story about an informal settlement to get our attention. It can come from any part of humanity because we're all fairly complex. Uh, but I think that what we do come to the movies to see is really some um, some set of a, a contending realities essentially being navigated by these human beings um, that allows us to reflect on our own lives and, and ways forward. Um, I wanted to touch, if you allow me, vigilance a bit on uh, issues of, um, uh, it was kind of provoked a little bit by uh, Sifiwe, um, uh, genre, right? Um, and, you know, one other exciting thing about being African today is that we're seeing African movies go into lots of different genres that were not there. And, you know, futurist, um, Afrofuturism, science fiction, um, the movies um, uh, that, you know, we're now seeing like Supermodo, if I can uh, just use one Kenyan movie, which was a, really a movie about this young child that had a terminal illness. And um, throughout the movie, uh, very beautifully uh, uh, developed. Um, the community is essentially woken up to essentially to give this child her dream, right? It's just a wonderful, gorgeous movie. But it's also a movie about affordable healthcare, right? It's also about absentee fatherhood. It's also about the power of women in communities. Um, another movie, another genre, which is, which is really the, the genre of, I guess, the thriller. Um, you know, uh, Saleh Farah, one of my favorite heroes, um, he was a, a Muslim cleric and was on a bus coming from the north of Kenya, coming to Nairobi. And uh, the uh, terrorist gang uh, or militia, uh, Al-Shabaab, basically jumped onto the bus and demanded for all the Christians, uh, for all the Muslims to get off the bus um, so that the Christians could be executed inside the bus. And Saleh Farah, a Muslim cleric, um, told them, I am a Muslim cleric. He greeted them. Um, and he said, I can recite um, the uh, Quran 
um, and you will have to kill me first. And he took the first bullet um, rather than have his Christian uh, brothers and sisters be killed by another Muslim. Um, wonderful story. The story is what what it. Um, and just what a wonderful uh, story to tell. I, I mean, I could go on. 18 Hours, the movie of emergency healthcare. Um, the Letter, uh, the recent movie by Maya Van Leco that really talks about the hunting down of mediums in society, spirit mediums. Some people call them witches, um, but spirit mediums um, and, and the execution of them. But so there's so many different genres. So I think we have to celebrate and encourage a diversity of genres. Last one, I'm, I'm sorry, but you can see I'm completely passionate and nobody has asked me to talk about movies the entire year. Um, and with COVID, I have literally watched every single thing I can find on Netflix um, and uh, uh, some other websites that I shan't mention in case I get arrested. Um, but let me, let me turn to one other uh, uh, point, which is the management of the industry, right? And I think we have to be clear that um, many of the most powerful industries are still dominated by people with power, privilege, and money, right? And there is nowhere else um, more stark than this, than Hollywood, right? Um, you know, Hollywood, 83% um, of the top five American broadcast networks the talent agencies and the Hollywood studios are really controlled by white people um, or people of, of European descent. And uh, many of them are male, right? Um, so when we see a movie by somebody like, let me say, uh, Sidi Poitier, uh, one of our elders, an African-American, or Spike Lee, or Steve McQueen more recently, or my, one of my favorites, Ava DuVernay. And of course, yes, I am dropping names. If you're watching this, please be writing down these people because they are just on a roll. Uh, Pete Townsend has just produced another movie that uh, we should all be watching. Um, uh, you know, when, when we see these people emerge from the industry called Hollywood, we have to accept that this has been a long time coming. This has been really a civil rights movement within an industry of reproduction of humanity. Um, let me just end with one last one. Um, in the Hollywood Academy at the moment, there are no less than, you know, four or five Kenyan women. Um, uh, I, I just, you know, it, it blows my mind every time I hear this because I know what the Hollywood Academy has been. And of course, you've just heard that 83% um, really are dominated by people of European descent. But people like Tony Kamau, Wanjiru Njendu, uh, Judy Kibingi, uh, Wanuru Kehio, Kahio, these are people, uh, women, African women, who really now are in a driving seat uh, in this industry. And we just must celebrate them and demand that they open the door wider for all of the others uh, to be able to step in. So I'll stop there. And I hope I've not gone on for too long. The next response will be much shorter if I get a chance. No, that's that's OK. We are actually just enjoying this discussion because by the end of the day, we have such forums so that we learn, we get to know more and become more informed. Uh, so thank you so much, Mr. Irungu, for the detailed, detailed response. Uh, Jen Waidera, just to get to you, uh, in regards to trying to advocate for people with alb albinism, most of the time the comment that comes from the public is in as much as organizations and society do these lovely films that are agenda driven. People do not get to see them. People do not get to learn. And the thing that we, we, we're trying to say is films are good medium in terms of trying to educate, inspire, change narratives, change perception. How best is your organization uh, doing in regards to ensuring the general public access has access to the films that you made so that it is not just made for the organization library, but it's made for the public to be able to learn, engage, and become better? So one of our distribution channels really is more to everyone because even as much as I have albinism, I'm a woman. I'm a child to someone, and I'm a mother and a wife to somebody. So what we've been trying to do a lot is to normalize this kind of documentaries and to like show them to everybody and not just to our communities. I know like also the conversations around just diversity have been are more welcomed now than they were 10 years ago when we were actually starting. And it was always hard to start the conversation, but I must admit that currently conversations around just being different and diversity and uh, 
everything else that comes with just being different are really much welcome. So for us as an organization, of course, uh, initially the consumption was really meant for families and those impacted directly by albinism. But uh, with time, we've gone diversifying our scope and audiences. So because like uh, we're looking at albinism also as a public health issue, it's in your genes. So anybody, you may be a future parent, grandparent, grandmother, or somebody, or a service provider to someone with albinism. So this information and knowledge needs to go out to everyone. So we are really in that part. And we also hope that other filmmakers and other people working on documentaries and other uh, medias that go to the public can also start not only using us when they want to talk about albinism or when they want to talk about the sad story or the sad character, but also start using us as the protagonist in the movie, just like I think Philippe mentioned previously. Mr. Sifiwe, I'll just jump uh, to you, just to be able to understand as a creative person, and in terms of trying to address some of these injustices, then how do you create the balance to ensure that the creativity part is not killed, as well as um, securing funds? Because most of the time, even if you access financiers, most of them want stories that will drive something. Stories, we say, the, uh, Mr. Rungu gave us a word, stories that bring attention. But here is a situation where you're so, you've seen this injustice and you've seen uh, anything that you want to address. But now the, the, the fact that it doesn't have that sort of, how do I put it? It doesn't have sort of that attention, but you just want to do it. For instance, if you look at Zola, the movie that you did, it's not a story that will bring that attention, but it's a story that addresses something. Then how do you create the balance in terms of financing of a film that advocates for social change, as well as how do you ensure in the process of shooting something as a creative person, the creativity aspect is not lost? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I think um, with regards to, 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 to filmmaking, um you know um you know mr urungu also touched on it when he spoke about like the protagonist and a goal you know so it is important um for example because when you look at Tola, um you know it's not about uh disability you know it's mm -hmm. about this character who comes back from the united states and you know when he's coming back you know he thinks he's going to reconnect with his girlfriend that he hasn't seen in like three years because he was in the USA and then he's going to start a business, you know, of photography, you know, in, in, in the township, you know, but then when he comes back, he discovers that he's his cousin, you know, that he, you know, he was close with before he left, you know, was, 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 was killed by, you know, by drugs. And then he now sees this drug problem in his community. And then he wants to, you know, uh, you know, stop this, this drug problem. And then he then discovers that it's the mayor, Who's actually you know selling the drugs in the community and then he goes up against the mayor and eventually exposes the mayor you know uh to the community and um you know to the public you know so when you watch the movie there is a a, a goal and there is um you know obstacles that the the character has to go through and um but eventually we see you know the the, the character you know the main character the protagonist win at the end you know even though i was addressing disability you know, but the story was not centered on, on disability. You know, it was centered on a character who had a specific goal. And so I think with regards to stories, yes, we may try and address something, you know, um, you know, a certain issue, you know, um, we may try and discuss human rights, but the story must have, the story must be about something, you know, mm -hmm. and then through the, the, you know, and then through the journey that we, we, we follow of the protagonist, other things that we are trying to address, they can come through, you know. So, for example, that disability came through in the movie, but the movie was not about disability, you know, because sometimes it, it, it can be, you know, boring for the audience when we watch a movie and then, uh, you know, we focus it on on, on, on on a certain subject, you know, and there's no goal in, 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 in the story and the character that is not on a journey. We are just, you know, uh, addressing something. It's more like, um, you know, you are now telling the news. It's like you've written an article, and you know, because when you when when you when you read the news, there's no um, there's no journey. You know that they are just addressing you know an issue. 
you know, that is being seen and then they speak about it on the news. But whereas with storytelling, it's a bit different. There has to be um, a goal, there has to be obstacles. And then eventually we want to see the protagonist win. So um, I think it is very important to, you know, for, for, to have those elements, you know, in, in storytelling, it, whether it's a comedy, you know, it can be a comedy about someone with, with, with a disability, but then in the comedy, we see them, you know, being on a journey. And then, um, in the, but when you look at the movie, you will see that the, the writer spoke about disability, addressed disability, but they were not focused on that. You know, the same thing as Tola, when you watch it, you actually forget that this person is, actually has a disability. It's only when you sit back and realize and think about it, you're like, what? How did a person with disability overcome this? And then through that, you are then inspired, you know, as a storyteller, you are then inspired to say, wow, you know, actually people with disabilities can, you know, do, you know, other things as well. So I think even with regards to funding as well, when you go uh, uh, and look for funding, you know, from, uh, because for example, with, with Tola, it was funded by, you know, the, the, the National Film and Video Foundation, which is an organization in South Africa you know, that deals with, 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 with supporting filmmakers, you know. So, for example, when one was looking for funding for Tola, I was not looking for funding to uh, to address disability. I was looking for funding, you know, because I wanted to tell a story about a character who exposes, you know, a drug situation in his community, you know. And through that, um, you know, they were, you know, they, they, they believed in the concept because, uh, number one, drug, Drug problem is something which we have all over the world. You know, we have it in, in Africa, we have it, you know, in, in Europe. It's it's something which we see, you know, a lot of the youth now, they are on drugs, you know. So, you know, uh, although the, the, the main character is someone with a disability, but I was not focusing on that. I was focusing on uh, this character, the protagonist, exposing something which is a problem in his community. But then with the main character being a person with a disability, that on its own was able to inspire people to show people that you know what um you may have a disability but that doesn't mean that you can't solve problems in your community that doesn't mean that you can't inspire people in your community and then that's why uh you know people were now able to to to, to relate to the story and what's amazing is that even people who don't have disability actually love the story you know because they can relate to it even you know people who, with disability they can also relate to it they now see Kola as this superhero people with disability see Kola as the superhero because they're like what someone with a disability actually can do this it means i can also do this i must not limit myself uh, thank you so much Sifiwe. and just to get to mr irungu i think for the longest time the conversation we've always had is majority of the citizens still do not understand that human rights are fundamental particularly if you look at some uh some of the conversation people have people still believe that human rights are are, are western concepts that do not they cannot relate to or they cannot domesticate such concepts how best then can uh uh organizations like yours that are fighting for human rights uh embrace films to actually tell people human rights are not western concept but these are rights that we all use them we all need to domesticate them and we all need to give them power because they are for us and not just for the western world so i guess a, a couple of thoughts i think on this one one is that i think you know as human rights organizations and uh, defenders we maybe have done a disservice by framing the human rights language in terms of international protocols, conventions, mm -hmm. and um, standards. I mean, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a great document, um, but in Kenya today, the more important document uh, in many ways, uh, although we don't necessarily have to pit them against each other because they are somewhat informed, um, you know, they are informed by similar process, is the Constitution of Kenya, right? Um, and the Constitution of Kenya was passed with over 60% um, support in a referendum uh, by Kenyans. And therefore, the uh, rights that are in the Constitution that relate to, for example, Chapter um, uh, chapter 4, uh, the Bill of Rights, um, that uh, no human being can be discriminated against, uh, sexually um, abused or um, excluded, and that everybody has the same level of uh, rights and freedoms as everybody else. Um, that is not a Western construct. That is a Kenyan construct generated by 30 years of organizing um, by those of us who felt that we deserved better and uh, to be treated better by our state. And we weren't really looking to former colonial powers and imperialists to uh, give us that direction. We were really clear that this would come from within. Um, so I think that narrative um, 
you know, can shift a bit. And I think once you, you reframe it differently, you know, the question is who can, who can argue with the idea that um, everybody should have the right to, to affordable health care? Who can argue with the idea that we shouldn't have the right to education? And who can argue that um, against the idea that we really should not be shot on the basis um, of one police officer's um, you know, uh, thought. And I, so I think this is, this is an interesting one. Let me turn to um, uh, something I know that Philip wants us to turn to, which is really of the issue of censorship. And um, I think this is a great one um, in the sense that uh, this sometimes is also framed in terms of a North, South, Europe, Africa framework. But, you know, I, th I think we have to, first of all, acknowledge that, you know, over the years, um, you know, Western societies, European societies, American societies have had their share of censorship of uh, movies, um, as has been the case in places like um, uh, the Middle East and, and Africa. You know, uh, Noah or the uh, Passion of the Christ was banned in Qatar. Um, Lebanon banned uh, Wonder Woman. Um, Nigeria banned a South African movie called District 9, a science fiction movie that had uh, Nigerian uh, sounding characters at the center of the, um, of the, the bad guys, who were the bad guys. Kenya has banned uh, Rafiki and um, I Am Samuel, two excellently filmed um, movies that have won awards um, or have been internationally recognized. But here in Kenya, we have to watch them on VPN or um, under our, um, you know, under the under our covers because we can't watch them publicly. Yet uh, in the case of Rafiki, for the moment, for that one week that the court ruled that Kenyans would have a right to watch Rafiki, um, uh, at Prestige, I was informed that in that one week, um, more people watched Rafiki than watched um, uh, Black Panther. Um, and just let me add with a light touch, you know, people's sexuality didn't change as they walked out of the cinema. Um, this is the other thing about, you know, the, the, uh, the, the kind of limited perspective of homophobes is that they think that by watching something, you will immediately go and do this. Um, yes, power is, you know, filmmaking has power, it, it influences, but I think it's ludicrous to think that just because we watch a movie about a drug smuggler, uh, we will become drug smugglers. Or if we watch a movie about a, um, a killer, we will become killers. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, open up the conversation. I think, uh, uh, Jane, you also want us to talk a little bit about the role of creatives and, the, yeah. and funding, right? Um, which is a big issue. It's a big issue domestically in our countries. Yeah, so maybe uh, Mr. Dr. Felipe, you can pick up on uh, the question that Jen has brought up in terms of how do you tackle the issue of creatives and funding, particularly in cases where the filmmakers overstep the rights for selling or for the sake of emotional stories? Yes, uh, maybe before that, just to finish on the censorship, um, because I, okay. I agree with what you said, um, okay. it's, uh, it's interesting to... Uh, there's, there's two parts of the of, of the story actually we can tell story but we need someone to listen to the story so when we tell stories and nobody listens to those stories um that's that's the point that is missed uh in kenya it happened with rafiki and i am samuel it also happened with my movie Kapala cannot be shown in kenya so it's quite brave of the festival to nominate it because actually you can't even show it in uh, in kenya um, but it's not the only country um, that cannot show um, Kapana. So um, I think it should not be a deterrent. We have to keep on telling those stories uh, and we have to keep on convincing the censorship um, that, uh, yes, it's not because you see a movie about someone of different sexuality that you will change your sexuality overnight. Um, that doesn't happen like that. But it's a working process. And um, that's maybe linked to the question now of Jane, is that sometimes as filmmakers, we want to tell the story that matter to us, but then if we know that those stories cannot be shown in the country when we are, um, we make compromises. And sometimes that's when we start to make compromises that we also can lose our integrity. Um, the Some people will um, try to have an, human rights issue in their movie just for the sake of getting some funding, but mm -hmm. are not passionate about that issue. Uh, and that's totally wrong because then the money will go to the wrong person. Uh, and maybe they will make a film about GBV or a film about disability or whatever, but their heart is not there and they just use it to access some funding. Um, when other people who really, really, really want to tell those stories then can't access those funding because it has been taken up by the wrong 
person. Um, how to avoid that? I don't know because it's the work of the producers and it's the work of the funding company to try to find out the right product and the right person. Uh, but it's true. It's true that some people um, will maybe have a character with disability in their movie just for the sake of accessing funding uh, for the movie. Um, and that's wrong. Um, so um, it's important, I think, for the organization that are financing movies to ask themselves why, why is a person um, involving in this issue? Why is a person wanting to have a character with disability or a character with a different um, sexual orientation or whatever? Uh, is it genuine or is it just to access some of the funding that we are providing? Um, and unfortunately, when it's the wrong person accessing the funding, it can do more damage than good. Um, and that's really a pity. So I think um, we need to be a little bit cautious and we need to be careful uh, about who is, accessing, who is accessing which part of funding, for what reason, and for what audience. Um, but ultimately, uh, it's also important as a filmmaker to not compromise too much and to not um, think, okay, I will change my story that way because if I change it that way, I can access some funding. Uh, and then you lose, I mean, come back to the question you were asking, Sifiwe, then you lose your creative freedom. And I think as a, as a, as a filmmaker, the moment you lose your creative freedom, you're, you're done. <laughs> um, you need to be able to tell the story you're passionate about. And you can actually only do a good job if you tell a story you're passionate about. If you start to tell a story for the sake of telling a story, it won't work. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Felipe. And just to pick up on what you've said in regards to when when the organization or the society are trying to get people to do stories that are in line with their vision and their values, there are some people who are very good when it comes to writing proposal. They'll write it for the sake of it, but not for the sake of trying to drive their agenda forward and the vision forward. Uh, generally, there in terms of your organization, how then do you ensure that the people you work with in terms of your projects hold the integrity and they uphold the values and the vision of your organization? So, uh, basically, as a process, we actually have a lot of internal procedures and controls in terms of even just saying yes somebody to interview whether it's our beneficiaries or ourselves or even just anyone that is linked to our work and i think the fact that we have uh, we have come to the point where we understand when our rights are overstepped then we also have the right to say no to uh offers or things that we feel like are going to lower the dignity and the humanity of the people that work with them. And actually, the reason I had actually raised the question on funding and, and of course, filmmakers of accepting uh, the human rights of people, I, I, mm -hmm. I have, we have had an experience where I ran a campaign, Mount Kilimanjaro, with five African women up to the summit. There was a filmmaker involved, and in between, when we were doing the clip, of course, we noticed a lot of other small, like, rights violations where we all felt this was not good for us. And yet, the content was short, but we never eventually gave consent for that documentary to be released because uh, we, we kind of felt it doesn't speak to why we clip. You know, like when you clip for social injustices and and then you experience this from the same person telling your story, then you are at a point where you're like, it's very conflicting. It's an amazing story. It was a big achievement to have five African women with albinism in Kilimanjaro, but we got to a point where like human rights came first and the impact this documentary would have had. So really, I think for us, it's more about human rights, comfort, the dignity and the respect and the 
everything else and anything that surpasses that we are not we don't open ourselves to it of course we are wiser now we go further to interrogating why the person is interested in the story and we actually want to see the script and everything even before we can say yes so that if it doesn't yeah. our vision and our mission then we have a right to say no but of course the, the same people may end up in other hand in people who may not know their rights or don't know where to stop them. And like we had that experience and I think in future we would never want to get anyone in such hands, you know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and Mr. Irungu, also, I would love to get your thought on the same because we know we understand that Amnesty as well does support some of the projects. and. This I can tell because I've also been involved in one of the projects that you funded where you're trying to push the human rights ad agenda forward. How do you then ensure that the people you commit to work on projects, particularly in terms of creating of the films or, or any uh, creative element, they uphold the integrity and the values that Amnesty International stand for? I mean, I, mean, I think it would be hypocritical of us um, to stand for the freedom of expression Mm -hmm. And at the same time, to dictate um, content um, to film workers that filmmakers that work with us, I think we um, we we sometimes make choices based on the vision of filmmakers. Uh, that's true. Um, mm -hmm. We we won't work with people that will um, promote uh, misogyny, sexism, homophobia, um, anti um, you know kind of um, uh, you know albinism. Uh, we we won't work with you. I mean, I mean, just to be clear. Um, because we do not believe that you are bringing, you are advancing an agenda that is in line with a progressive appreciation of humanity. Yes, we will. Uh, we will support films that show the complexity, that discuss issues of homophobia, that discuss issues of uh, discrimination. But we do, we don't really want to just help um, one small elite to um, uh, impose their views on a, on a number of other uh, uh, you know communities. So so that's just the first thing. But again, we would not. We would not write a script for a filmmaker, for example. I, I just wouldn't uh, think that that's a healthy thing to do because, you know, ultimately filmmaking is a creative exercise, right? So um, maybe one day we will have a filmmaker working for Amnesty International and we'll give them a budget and say, go make wonderful movies. But actually, on that note, maybe our communications team, um, they're not as, um, you know, kind of uh, as, as distinguished as some of you on the call. But, um, you know, uh, they do produce content that is visual. And I think, you know, maybe a quick comment on this is, you know, we are moving away from a world in which um, films move um, uh, perspectives um, and behavior to a point where something like TikTok, you know, a 15 second, 30 second clip has the capacity to be to go viral and be seen by a million people when some of our movies aren't seen by more than five, six, six thousand people. Right. Um, um, the YouTube phenomenon um, is something that, you know, we have to embrace. These are new platforms to for us to be able to do things uh, that we've always been doing through cinemas and uh, to our movies and so on. But let, let me touch on one other issue, um, which, which I think is really critical. You know, the creative industry during COVID-19 really suffered. And I'm, I'm saying something, you know, that everybody knows already. So it's not a new point. But I think, you know, what I was struck um, a little back, a while back when I was kind of looking at this space in the context of um, Kenya, um, and there was a great HEVA study that was done um, somewhere in the middle of 2020. And I guess I just looked up those stats again. You know, 68% of creatives work as individuals, not in companies, right? 68%. Yes. So six, almost seven out of 10 creatives are individuals, not companies or, or creative uh, cooperatives. 15% of the companies, so that's really like the three out of 10, 15% of those companies have between one and 10 people on payroll, right? So therefore, the majority of creatives are really seasonal casual workers, right? Working on specific projects. And in between those projects, like in COVID-19, you know, there's long periods. Um, I'm very proud, um, although it caused a little bit of angst at one point because uh, uh, she studied economics. I'm very proud to be the father of uh, what they now call an actor. In my days, uh, you had actors and you had actresses. I'm told now that's old school, that they're all actors. Um, but she, she's an actor. And, um, you know, I watched her really navigate and stand for her craft in an environment in which there is no, there's no real government support for this. Um, 
the private support is really tunneled into very few um, uh, you know, production companies. Um, and many, many people just have no protection um, when you know, contracts are, uh, such, are just cancelled or service order um, you know, kind of contracts are just cancelled almost at will. Um, uh, during this period, um, and um, you know, many of our creatives, you know, have not yet come out of the environment where they've had to cut their income by fifty percent um, just because there's no work, because there's no finance, there's no investment, and I think that's the big challenge. Yeah, and that is well said because I think for majority of the creatives, I think COVID situation really hit home. And some of them went into depression. Other people know how to look for plan B in terms of how am I going to even get food in my table? How am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to sort my bills? So this is a discussion we're going to pick in the next segment. I uh, just for any person joining this particular conversation on our Facebook and YouTube page, today we are talking about films and human rights. Uh, in our panel, Panelists, uh, we have Mr. Irungu Huton, the Executive Director of Amnesty International Kenya. We have Sifu Mbata, the CEO for Fever Media, all the way from South Africa. We have Jen Waidera, the founder of Positive Exposure Kenya. We have Dr. Felipe Talavera, who is the Director and Producer of Oil Trust. And just to read some of the comments coming in on our social media platform, uh, we have Perry Njoki saying, Mr. Irungu, you are so passionate about films. You should be a filmmaker, you know, someday. <laughs> yeah, so welcome to the film industry. Uh, we Thank have you. Josh Atkins saying, thanks, Mr. Irungu. We have Felista Stairo saying, well articulated. And Mfo Mbata, all the way from South Africa, saying, I'm watching from Pretoria, Pretoria Glen in South Africa. So in our next segment of discussion, I would love us now to uh, dive deep into the world of social media and how social media has a lot of impact, particularly in terms of advocacy, films, and just trying to expose some of the ills. And if you're in Kenya, we all know of the famous blogger called Edgar Obare, who usually uh, he's like a police patrol in terms of injustices, and I think people find it easier to just uh, relate and send him information. I'll start with Dr. Felipe Talavera. Uh, with the organization, how well are you embracing social media as a platform for continued advocacy? I think you have no choice. Um, but, uh, but I also think uh, it's important to differentiate filmmaking from social media. Mm -hmm. Like uh, like uh, Inungu mentioned, TikTok and uh, those phenomena. Yes, you can glo go global, you can go viral, uh, you can mm -hmm. have 6 million views in, in two days, uh, but you cannot tell the same complex story in a 15-second TikTok or a two-minute YouTube um, um, ad that you would with a one-hour movie. So those are completely different medium. One of the difficulties, though, mm -hmm is that more and more young people are used to social media and their time span is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. They basically want in two minutes what we used to get in 60 minutes. And that can be dangerous because we cannot give the same content in two minutes than we can give in 60 minutes. We cannot, uh, we cannot discuss the same level of complexity in two minutes as we can in 60 minutes. So social media is a very important and interesting tool because it's immediate, it's easily accessible, and it's easily shareable. It should complement other tools such as movies, but not replace them. Um, and I don't believe there will ever be uh, an equivalent to, um, to filmmaking in terms of social media. We just have to be careful with uh, as much as it is very good that we have this instant, quick, uh, quick space, a quick paced uh, approach with social media, to not make it the only norm that exists, um, because um, we need to be able to encourage people to reflect. And when you look at something that is two minutes long or fifteen seconds long, you don't really reflect; you just absorb it. And um, we have to find a balance and we have to find a way of using social media in a way that will encourage people to reflect, um, to think, to discuss, to want to know more. Uh, and 
obviously to also find out what is the right information and what is the wrong information I mean, with social media there is also this whole issue of fake news so how do you learn to differentiate the right news from the fake news how do you learn to question what you've seen uh, and how do you learn to uh, want to find out more not from the same source but from a variety of sources okay and i think also just to add on that i think for the longest time right now most of the time people have been saying we're not doing films because we do not have access to cameras but at this particular time we even have phones that can shoot quality quality stuff you don't need an actual camera but you can use a, a phone with a good camera to just shoot something and just tell your own story. I'd come, I'd love to engage Mr. Irungu in regards to the Amnesty International, uh, uh, Amnesty and LIP uh, Student Phone Challenge. What inspires your organization to actually partake in such an initiative and just make it particularly for young people within the university environment? No, I mean, it's a simple answer, you do. You inspire us. Um, you, wherever I see young people and even elderly people really thinking about how to um, uh, interrogate, to like I think as Philippe says, how to reflect on the human experience, particularly the Kenyan experience. Um, for us, um, you, you, you know, you've got us right. Uh, we're interested. Um, the more you talk about, you know, the complexity of building a society, fun, you know, that is founded on. Um, our national values as a country as enshrined in the constitution, um, it's much easier, right? So uh, you inspire us, that's an easy one. Um, okay, and uh, uh, Sifiwe, I think also with you as a filmmaker, how then do you set the balance to ensure people will still have to get, walk into the cinema, sit down for two hours or one hour or 90 minutes and just sit there and watch your film without feeling like time, time, and the panic and everything. OK, OK. Um, be before I answer the question, um, mm -hmm. I would like to first speak about um, social media, you know, how it has helped me, <coughs> you know, in my company. So basically, at the start of, um, you know, COVID, you know, uh, I think that was 2020, um, you know, I couldn't meet with my, my crew members. I couldn't shoot anything in South Africa. So I decided to do comedy skits from home. Um, you know, thank God I do have, you know, equipment which I use to shoot my movies. So mm -hmm. in these comedy skits, I play different characters. So I would play the, the dad, I would play the, the mom, I would play the, the aunt, I would play the, the gardener, I would play the son. And then um, I did one episode and then I posted it on, on, on TikTok and... I was just surprised when it got like I think over thirty thousand, you know, views, you know, within a short space of time, and then my TikTok account grew from there. I think now it's sitting on um, on on, on twelve thousand followers on TikTok, mm -hmm. and I get um, you know you know good views, you know, and also um, seeing that we also couldn't shoot movies. One also started doing interviews whereby I was interviewing, you know, different entrepreneurs uh, about their businesses and also, you know, doing vlogs as well. Um, so um, I love what you touched on that now with social media, you don't really have to have, you know, equipment. You know, it does not mean that if you don't have equipment, you can't do anything, you know, because uh, a lot of young, you know, uh, people, especially creatives, they'll complain about funding. Yes, we know funding is an issue, but you can't uh, base your career just on funding. You know, you need to be able to use what you have. And, 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 and that's what I believe, you know, that's my, my motto and that's what I believe in when it comes to, to storytelling, that you need to use what you have. You know, not right now you can use, uh, if you have a smartphone, you can use that to shoot, um, you know, a short film. I love what, what I've seen in the festival, whereby I was watching movies that were shot on, on smartphones, which, you know, it, it, which I believe is good. You know, so right now with social media, you don't really have to wait until you know you, you get millions of dollars of funding. You can use what you have, and also it's really about understanding, um, you know, that medium that you are using. For example, with with, with filmmaking, if you are telling a, a sixty to seventy minute feature film, there's time, you know, to develop characters. You know, your character can start off like your protagonist can start off 
maybe with a certain fear and then maybe when the story finishes your protagonist o- overcomes that fear because there's that time but with social media there's no time for character development so it's mainly you discuss a certain problem and then in that moment and then within two minutes you have to be done so it's like you discuss an issue and then after afterwards you are done so it's really about understanding the the different platforms if you are doing on social media understanding that i don't have the luxury of time you know to develop to, to develop the characters to bring the character background you know to have you know the protagonist have a goal and um yes a protagonist can have a goal in in, 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 in a two minute because you can you know see something and then maybe you want to attain it and then something happens and then we are out so it's really about understanding you know this that, that those platforms that one is using you know but um the beauty of it now is that you know creatives you are not limited now that's the beauty of it is that it's not really about um you know if you don't have money you can't do anything you can basically use what you 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 have and with regards to 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 me and how i do it because you mentioned about uh you know um you know getting people to the cinema and having them sit down and not get tired so with me every movie that i do i actually premiere it at the cinema in in south africa mm-hmm. so there's a cinema called the bioscope cinema which is a local cinema for 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 young um you know for actually independent filmmakers because if you have self funded you if you 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 self funded your movie and there's no funding you can't take your your that movie to to big cinemas because already maybe the the, the money that they will charge you know you won't even have it because you know that movie was not even funded so a lot of the movies that I've produced um you know they they were self funded you know and then i was able to premiere them at 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 the cinema which is called the bioscope and the reason why i was able to 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 get people to sit down and actually enjoy the movie it is because number one i understand my target audience you mm-hmm. know and when i was writing when i was doing the movie i knew who i was targeting so for for example i grew up in in you know in in Johannesburg in Soweto in 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 South Africa so most of the stories that i write i write stories that i know and the people that i will invite to the cinema i will invite people that i know they'll be able to relate to that story and i'm a, i'm also a big fan of writing comedy because i love you know i love it when people laugh you know so the reason why people will sit and watch is because they can relate to it is because when they are watching they actually for that hour they actually forget about the problems they are going through or you know the things they are facing in life and just fo- focus on that and then they are caught up in this world and then they forget and then when when the movie is finished that's when they go back you know to the real world so it's really about understanding who, what your target audience is what is my target market who am i targeting with this specific movie and then also really about understanding the different platforms you know knowing that with social media i don't have the luxury of time i need to hook my audience within those 2 minutes and then i'm out and whereas with movies there is time for character development there is time to take the audience on a on a journey because it's 1 hour it's 70 minutes but yeah thank god for social media because social media has really really honestly on my side really helped me and uh, i believe it's also going to help more filmmakers as well because with content now it's not limited to only movies there's vlog you can do vlogs you can you know do interviews with entrepreneurs you can shoot short films on your on your smartphone so there's so many content that we we we, we can do now as creatives Yeah thank you so much and just to pick to just add to what you said in regards to social media and how it has helped I think it it is even helping the organization and institution well because I see I'm a, a, a a loyal follower of the work that Amnesty International does and I see the communication people really doing a good job in terms of even trying to capture the attention of young people by they always have posting about Amnesty membership how to register on TikTok and you see the reality that you have to accept is we do not not all young people enjoy reading not all young people enjoy the long stuff so i think social media just is a sort of a blending to what is already there but we have this blend that now says okay wait let us come to reality and understand we have this group of people who they just want to da 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 da, da do things quickly or just see things quickly and then people get information so with with platforms like tiktok you then now get the attention of people who just want to watch something for 60 seconds and just get the whole concept on the whole idea and things to go on like that and then i'll go to you genuine there 
uh, in regards to embracing of social media, has your organization embraced it? And if they have, how has the impact been with you blending actual film and actual physical setting and then now you transport it into the social media world? So actually we do embrace social media because our audiences are in different spaces. Mm -hmm. And I think this has really been, it's, I would say it's not like our exclusive means, but mm -hmm. it's alternative means on how we disseminate our information. Mm -hmm. and I think even with the rise of COVID, we have all learned that any information on every information can actually be transmitted very quickly via social media. So what we've done is uh, we actually have a mobile application called Albinism and I, and we upload all our content and all our updates in the app. And then this app, we have community ambassadors in different parts of the country. And these community ambassadors are equipped with mobile phones because uh, not everybody then has access to social media, but these community ambassadors are able to still redistribute and redisseminate the key messagings that we keep sending to communities at their community level without us having to travel all the way to go like share a, a documentary or share a short film or share an exhibit. So really, I think social media is probably the was the missing gap uh, initially, but I feel like now it's made us get more connected with bigger audiences. I, however, still feel uh, a lot of content, especially when, like, you know, like when you want to, like, just explain the genetics of albinism, I am not sure, like, a 60 seconds video work, but mm -hmm. probably there's something alternative work. But I mean, this repackaging messaging and content to the different platforms and the different purposes and audiences. So yes, we really like enjoy using social media and I think it's actually the future. Okay, thank you so much for that. And now I'll go to Mr. Irungu and just to understand, we, or for the longest time, I think most of the organization have always embraced the theater kind of advocacy where they'll get the groups, go to the communities and interact. But then now we see with film, you can create something that you can use in community A, B, C, D without the having a whole group traveling. What are some of the advantages of cinematic approach in regards to Amnesty and the work that you do? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I smiled when you asked that question, such a great question. Huh? Um, you know, uh, the human rights movement in Kenya 20, 30 years, um, if you were to look at some of the seeds of uh, Amnesty's work, it was places like Kamarithu uh, Theater in Limuru and um, people like Gogiwa Thiongo and Gogiwa Miri who um, um, popular theater, you know, and they talked about traveling theater and they really use theater to conscientize um, uh, communities, not, not to uh, create propaganda, but really to get communities to look at themselves more um, generically and, and more um, incisively. And of course, in those days and like now, really, they were, they were trying to generate a conversation about inequalities. Um, why is it the case that um, you could have a, a butter fa factory in Limuru in 1978 um, that made tremendous amount of profit for um, uh, the, 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 the owners of butter, but yet the people walked to the factory to make shoes and walked home with bare feet. And, and they were asking these kind of questions, right? And there's a whole history of uh, popular theater. And um, I, I, I still think there is, there is some power um, uh, very, you know, I, I still think there's a lot of power in live performances, um, and um, really, in many ways, plays and uh, musicals um, still have resonance for us in Amnesty. But of course, with COVID-19, uh, this is one uh, genre that, or one uh, for medium of expression that has been really put aside uh, until we were able to get past this miserable little virus that uh, has kept us from engaging each other. But I, I think, um, yes, there are some advantages, of course, with film, right? Which is, um, you can show it, it's much cheaper. I mean, let me give you one, uh, we, over the last couple of years, we've shown a couple of movies to different audiences. Uh, we've shown Just Mercy, uh, the movie about, um, uh, you know, the death penalty in the United States uh, to uh, the public here. We've had a number of uh, former death row prisoners talking about their experiences 
in committee maximum security uh, here in, in Nairobi. But the one that's most dramatic for me really was uh, we took uh, Ava DuVernay's um, four-part um, Netflix series called When They, uh, uh, when they See Us, I think it was, um, When They See Us, I think it was, um, to uh, Dandora. And um, Dandora is a really at the epicenter of um, all of the neglect uh, that you, you see in Kenya today. Um, it is also a place of creative, empowered, and very industrious people. But, you know, really what most people remember about Dandora is the dump site. It's really where all the rubbish uh, from uh, Runda and Mataiga and Kilimani, it's where all that ends up. And one of the things that we did when we showed the movie was bring... Um, you know, it's in a, it's a four-part series, eh? a four-part um, series, and uh, one part is very much, um, uh, you know, focused on investigators and the police. Another one focuses on uh, the legal system and uh, the, the law courts, and there's a third one that focuses on the public and the media. So we brought people to talk about um, what this would look like in a Kenyan context, and I just want to leave you with one uh, comment that was made by a young um, Dandora resident who came up to me and he said, Irungu, um, not only was the movie very powerful, which it is, he says, but this is the first time that I have met, I have been in the presence of a high court magistrate who wasn't trying to jail me. Yeah. And I was really touched by that because, in fact, I even feel the emotion now that actually the experience of young people, um, particularly in our informal settlements, is that the law enforcement agencies, the criminal justice system, is just there to criminalize them. It is not there to do uh, public education, legal education, and involve them in ensuring that we build a rule of law society. And I think that, for me, um, is the power of film. It wouldn't have happened if we had not taken uh, Ava DuVernay's series to Dandora. Yeah, and just to pick up on that, uh, I'd love to hear what uh, Mr. Felipe says, because then how best then can we ensure that we have this continued engagement between uh, the, the creation and in terms of reaching people, like making people to, to feel present, to feel, to feel the impact, to feel involved in the whole process and even in terms of the, the storytelling, because most of the time, also, when it comes to creation, we, we forget about the people actually experiencing uh, such injustices. We forget about this group. We do not involve them until later. How then can we make them feel involved, feel like they're part of this, and make them to just see a whole different perspective? I think there's plenty of ways you can use. Um, um, maybe just to... Uh, to reflect on what um, Inungu said, um, different medium have different advantages. Yes. Uh, and the power of film is that you can take a film from the US and show it in Kenya. To take a theater group from the US and bring it to Kenya would be a completely different um, story. Um, but a live performance, when you are in front of real people, has got a very different impact because on the, on the film, on the movie, on the two-dimensional uh, screen, um, you're not really in front of people. You, you're in front of characters, but not in front of people. So every medium has, has his, his or its advantage. In terms of involving the right community in the project, I think uh, it, it, has to, it has to start from, um, for me at least, it has to start from the script. If we write a script, we'll always write the script with the community we are targeting and with the community that is affected by the issue. For example, we did a, a film on child marriage. But also, I mean, that's one human right we haven't talked about today, but the issue of child marriage and children being forced to marry at, at an early age. I don't know what is the situation in Kenya, but it's happening sometimes in Namibia. And it's happening in a very specific community. So what we did is that we interviewed children uh, who had been through um, child marriage, and we worked with them towards creating the script. And then we took it a step further and went into a community where it happens um, and where we were lucky the headman and the traditional chief wanted to make a difference uh, and work with the community. So we brainstormed um, the script. We looked at how um, to make it more real, how to make it more concrete, how to engage the community. And actually it worked so well that at the end of the day, the community members became the actors. Um, so there's really uh, many ways you can uh, engage people and if your community members are the actors then obviously the other community or the surrounding community 
that will see the movie. They will relate to it because it's their, it's their uncle, auntie, um, friend, um, people they've seen at the bus stop um, sometime. So um, there's plenty of way to involve people. But I agree that it is very important not to write it from your own perspective. We all come with our own background. Um, we all come with our ideas. But um, if we want to make something that is impactful, we have to be, um, I think, um, honest enough that we don't have all the answers and work um, and in terms of a movie, especially from the script point of view, work with the people who are affected by the issue we want to address. They know better than us. They have experienced um, the issue in a way that we might not have ourselves experienced um, and work from their experience, from their perspective, work with them. Um, I always involve them as well with when we work with actors uh, to train the actors, to discuss with actors, to, um, to, um, to interact with actors as well um, and make it more like a community project in some way. It will not work everywhere because obviously it will work in Namibia, it's our community. Now if the film ended up in Kenya, it's not the same community. So obviously um, that won't have the same engagement, but um, it will still, I guess, bring a certain authenticity. And what you're looking for when you do a film that is addressing a human right is the authenticity. Back to what we are saying in the beginning, the reality is never black or white, is always complex. And if you want to get that complexity, you have to take it from the perspective of people who are affected by the issue. Yeah, and also just to pick up on what you've said, I think most of the time in as I, I, we forget about the engagement bit, but then there's also this thing that has just crossed my mind in terms of protection of people, particularly when it now comes to documentary, how do we then ensure the safety of those involved? Particularly, most of the time, if you're doing any project or documentaries that address human rights issue in relation to government injustices, how best can the rights and protection of the people involved in such projects be observed? I'll start with Mr. Irongo. Please unmute yeah. your mic. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, they have to be they have to be one of those um, in this conversation. Otherwise, it would not be a virtual conversation. <laughs> um, let me invite you, vigilance, just to rephrase the question again. In in regards to ensuring the, the the protection and safety of people involved, because particularly when you're dealing with projects that now highlight on the government injustices that are delved deeper, you find that sometimes the community is unsafe, or the the, the producers or the filmmakers are captured, or things go on. So how best can can we ensure the protection of people who are trying to create films that advocate for human rights issues? Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, that um, the filming industry, the actors, the uh, producers, the directors, they have to get involved in the freedom of expression uh, crusade. They have to be involved in protecting the space for them to be able to do what they do best, which is really to capture humanity in all its aspects and not really, um, you know, uh, be uh, beholden to the powers and the privileged uh, in society. I mean, I think the if you were to ask me what, what's the power of filmmaking um, for all you filmmakers out there, it is really to bring to light that those stories that people want to hide. You know, those uh, people who are excluded, those people who are ignored, those people who are disrespected. Um, that's the power of film. I mean, that's the, the thing that um, I think is worth uh, putting at the service of the industry. Um, so that's the first thing. So be involved. Um, you know, when, when, uh, a ban, when a film is banned, whether it be Philippe's film or Wanuri's film, you know, I think the whole industry needs to come out and say, well, you know, we are, we are actually not going to stand for this. We're not going to accept this. And I think that unity is what creates the first protection. The second protection really is, I think, you know, uh, um, ensuring that intellectual property is safeguarded. Um, and, you know, I, I made a joke about, you know, watching um, movies on, on websites that uh, we shall not name here. But I think it's really important um, to, when we move into this uh, culture of live streaming, to try and keep at the back of our minds that actually people put money together. Some of them borrowed, some of them, you know, put their life savings into making movies. And when we stream it for free, 
we essentially destroy um, the potential of other films being made. It's a little bit like uh, hugging somebody with their COVID-19 and expecting that you're going to be um, safe. It's just, it's just one of the things that can kill an industry. And then the last one, I think, of course, is having human rights organizations alert and ready to protect the freedom of expression um, so that we are issuing statements, we are uh, running interference and uh, challenging governments to do what is required by the constitution, which is to allow for the freedom of expression. So these would be three um, responses uh, to your question. Okay, thank you very much. So now as we go into the last segment of this particular discussion, I would just love to get a summary of each and every panel uh, member in regards to what's the way forward when it comes to the conversation about films and human rights and how best then can we come together as people in different sector in different sectors we have people in the ngo we have people in government we have people in the creative sector how best can we then come together to ensure that the agenda is driven forward and to ensure also that the films that we create as well as the narrative that we drive both are human rights agenda driven in as much as we have entertainment because by the end of the day we have to recognize not all creatives will will always fall into the advocacy space but just speak to this particular group that are so immersed into the use of films in advocacy i'll start with the uh, sifu and butter then i'll go to jenna idera and then i'll follow from there Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I, I think the the way forward um, is to you know keep telling our own African stories, mm -hmm. and also to to involve you know uh, people with disabilities, you know, and by by involving them, it's not only you know to have them in front of the camera, but also you know it would be good to have them as part of the crew, you know, to have um, someone with a disability you know, being the director, you know, to have someone with a disability being the, the, the producer, you know. So, and also another thing that I would love to see in filmmaking is, um, you know, us as filmmakers, you know, um, you know, growing our, our audience base, you know, growing our target audience. Because at the end of the day, you know, we have to make money from filmmaking. Yes. And yes. the, the only way we can make money is if we close that gap, the gap that we have with our audience. We need to find ways of reaching our audience, whether it's through, uh, you know, screening in a community hall and then having people, you know, come and pay. And then, you know, you generate money that way or whether it's through a cinema or whether it's, um, you know, through live streaming. But we have to find ways of really, you know, reaching our audience, because I think the main problem that we have as filmmakers is, is, is generating, you know, profit. You know, um, you know, for example, in South Africa, you know that uh, when you once you've done a movie, you aim to sell it to a broadcaster, you know, but what happens if if the broadcaster does not buy that movie from you, you know, how do you, how will you make money as a filmmaker? But, um, you know, I believe that the money is in the people, the money is in your audience. Once you have built your audience as, as a content creator, then you won't be limited because uh, once you do a movie and then you put someone with a, with a disability and you have an audience, you won't be afraid, you know, because you know that your, your audience loves your work, your audience appreciates what you do. You know, for example, if I give an example of, 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 of a filmmaker that I look up to, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tyler Perry, you know, uh, any movie that he does, he knows that his audience will come and support, you know, so he's built his, his, his audience. So I think that's something we really need to do as well as, as African, you know, you know, creators. So I think the way forward is for us to really, really, really Built, uh, you know, the, you know, know the built our the relationship we have with the audience so that we can generate money, uh, you know, uh, from from our consumer. And then also the way forward is also to do more content. You know, uh, let's not limit ourselves only to to television um, or, or cinema. And also don't wait for funding. What I believe, what I always say is that filmmakers must not wait for funding. If you have a story, you know, you must find a way to tell that story. And also it is also uh, uh, best to write what you know, write something that you can be able to shoot. For example, if I know that I won't have a 20 million budget, I can't put, uh, you know, explosions, you know, catch car scenes, you know, uh, you know, I can't put, you know, um, and I can't do an action movie knowing that the, the budget is not enough. So you also need to write something you know you can be able to shoot, you know, consider locations, consider the amount of actors you have, you know, in your story, you know, because, you know, based on, on, on the budget that you have. But my advice would be 
filmmakers must not wait they must push they must produce those stories because the only way and the beauty of it now is that there's so many platforms now there's so many opportunities look now I'm here in Nairobi attending a film festival, which shows that there's so many opportunities. If I hadn't done the movie, I wouldn't be here in Nairobi. But I'm here in Nairobi because I did that movie. You know, I took the step and then I did the movie. And now I'm attending the film festival where the movie is playing. So there are so many opportunities. So filmmakers just need to produce content and stop complaining about funding. Yes, funding is an issue, I know, but let's keep doing content. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sifuwe, for that uh, detailed closing remarks where you say, build on the relationship with you and your audience and let's not wait for funding. Uh, I'll go to Jen right there just to tell us what's the way forward in terms of art for advocacy, particularly in regards to your organization, which is uh, Positive Exposure Kenya. Uh, my way forward uh, definitely is to open our doors more to African filmmakers tell our stories because I think there's much more that we as Africans who understand the culture and the context can change the narrative on just how uh, persons with disabilities in general are portrayed in movies and documentaries. The other uh, bigger lesson I think for me moving forward is of course to really think uh, from a community driven perspective. I think most of the times we assume like our experiences are just the experiences of every other person with a disability or like with albinism. And I think telling diverse stories of different people with albinism then shows just how normal and how much they fit in the broader spectrum of the society. And then I've really taken the lesson of being authentic and uh, on overall, as we close, is also to push for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the film industry. And I like really what Sifu has said about uh, ensuring that uh, even if you include persons with disabilities, we not only include them as the cast of the movie, but also in terms of administration and everything else across the industry. So then that's where we start normalizing diversity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jenna Idera, for that powerful remark where you say, moving forward, authenticity, diversity, equity, and inclusion. But then you go ahead and say community-driven perspective, because most of the time, it's the assumption that makes our story weak. Uh, thank you very much. So I'll go to Dr. Felipe Talavera. You'll give us your closing remarks in regards to what's the way forward, particularly as an individual who is in this space already, and they're already doing something. So what's the way forward? I think the way forward is be passionate uh, and believe in the stories that you want to um, to tell. And even if you change one person's life, it's worth it. You don't have to aim at changing the whole world. Nobody, nobody can change the world. Um, so do what you can at your level. And if your story impacts one person, then it was worth it. It was worth um, doing it. Don't be scared. Don't get scared. Um, and we block ourselves um, as well. Uh, and, and I mean, even me, I can, I can talk about it. When, when we uh, started Capana, Capana is the first LGBT movie from Namibia. And a lot of people were saying, oh, should you do it? Is it not dangerous? You know, it's Sodomy, government is not in favor, blah, blah, blah. And then you start asking yourself a lot of questions. Should I get there? Should I not get there? But actually, no, don't. If you believe in the story, if you believe in the issue you want to address, um, do it, tell your stories. And yes, you might get some backlash sometimes. Yes, you might get some people who are not happy with you, uh, but that's part of the game. Um, you can't please everybody. And if you try to please everybody, then you will never make a story that has got an impact. So tell the story from your heart, believe in the issue you want to try to address. Don't try to change the world, just try to have the impact you can have at your level. Uh, and be passionate really i think that's the one thing that would be the most important be passionate about the things that you do thank you so much uh dr philippe i think what you've captured uh my attention with is when you say do what you can 
with what you have and even if you change one person's story it was worth it i think most of the time you're so consumed in i want to build a bigger thing i want to impact a bigger group and then we forget that small beginnings small beginnings are worth it so thank you so much for that closing remarks i'll go to mr irungu the executive director of amnesty international uh, you can just tell us what's the way forward in regards to having more films that advocate and drive the human rights agenda forward thank you so I, I would uh, close by just first of all thanking um, fellow panelists um, really for such a wonderful um, two hours of conversation. I do hope that it has energized those that have watched. I do hope that it has um, given power and purpose um, to those um, filmmakers um, today and tomorrow. Um, having said that, I think um, you know I think we always have to remind ourselves we are a story making continent. We have always been right. Um, we will always be. Um, a story-making continent. The question is, um, you know, are we willing to tell our stories in this form? And the beauty of this form is that, you know, it is there for life. I mean, it, uh, we are still watching movies that were done in the 1920s. Um, so once it is captured in film, it is really a record of a generation. And um, many of the movies we've discussed, um, you know, the films we've discussed this uh, last two hours really are um, testimony to that. So it is our time, Africa. It is our time, Africa. Um, uh, why do I say that? It is our time because, you know, um, we have evidence that those who have worked at their craft, those that have um, really struggled um, and the stories behind people like Lupita Nyong'o, um, you know, who burst onto our screens in Black Panther or is about to burst onto our screens in 355. Um, you know, uh, Mumbi Maina, who is about to feature in the next Matrix uh, movie. Um, Eddie Gadegu, uh, who is on uh, Netflix at the moment in the movie The Harder They Fall and was in a whole range of other um, series like Startup, like Census 8 and others. Um, and I could go on like this, but I think, you know, what I'd like to say is that, you know, these are not extraordinary human, human beings. These are very ordinary um, human beings who have just kept working at their craft and had the courage to continue when there was not enough funding, when there was not enough space. They have cracked uh, glass ceilings. They have opened doors. And really, um, the opportunity now is there for those of us who are bold enough, who are daring enough and have the, you know, the, the kind of the imagination to tell stories powerfully. Um, to step through those doors and uh, just to use one phrase that um, is not an African movie, but just so that I'm not accused of being too Africanist. Um, let me just end with the phrase from uh, Star Wars, may the force be with you all. May the force be with us all. Thank you so much. And I think also something that I like that you said is it is our time, Africa. I think there's no greater joy than just to see us as African embracing our elements, embracing our story, our stories, embracing our films. So thank you so much, my lovely panelists. Just to remind the audience, today we had Mr. Irungu from Amnesty International uh, Kenya. He's the executive director. We have Dr. Felipe Talavera, the director and producer of Oil Trust. We had Sifiwe Mbata all the way from South Africa and he's the CEO of Fever Media. And we also had Waidera, the director and founder of Positive Exposure Kenya. And just to remind our viewers, today's topic was films and human rights. And I believe we've all learned, we've all picked one or two things, and we've also just had a whole change of uh, perception and we are going to move together because it is our time, Africa. Before I end this particular forum, I just want to remind our audience that the festival continues up to Saturday. Tomorrow, we are going to have the screening of three films that is at Prestige Cinema Ngong Road. So if you have not watched uh, Mission to the Rescue, Ngara, the kidnapping all the way from Tanzania, as well as the tales of the accidental city, if you have not watched this particular film, we have the opportunity to go there. Let's meet, let's chat, let's have a good time at Prestige Cinema Ngong Road. Entry is free for everyone. So I don't see an excuse why someone will not attend this particular uh, screening. Also tomorrow we have a workshop going on from 11 to 1 p.m. It will be facilitated by Kenya Films Commission. And the workshop is about uh, film proposal writing, writing proposal for funding 
because you know kfc has a grant uh, thing going on so how best can one learn if not from the mouthpiece itself just learning on how to do your proposal to access funding and also last but not least we have a panel discussion tomorrow and it's going to be about documenting african history so everyone come in tomorrow at prestige cinema join us on zoom for on zoom for the workshop on film proposal funding and also join us in the evening on documenting african history discussion and then we have a few comments i love to read just to for you to know what people are saying people are saying interesting discussion on filmmaking in relation to human rights interesting conversation and people are really uh telling mr irungu you should join the film industry because we need people like you in the industry we have kamala saying uh the big names in the films are not extraordinary just uh trying to make uh, a statement on what you said and then we have wangeshi murage saying yes uh mission to the rescue nyara and tales of accidental city join us at prestige tomorrow and last uh comment is from sarah masese saying it is our time africa great and insightful conversation thank you so much to our lovely panelists we thank you so much for your insights sacrificing time to be here for two hours it's not an easy thing but we had an interesting conversation and mine is just to say moving forward it is time africa so let us work together to ensure we drive african agenda forward and give the session back to dr zaporokot who is going to play for us our festival probo for leaf 2021 thank you so much at a time where everything has gone virtual lake international pan-african film festival sixth edition takes you there From 3rd to the 6th of November, we take you there to experience humanity through workshops, panel discussions, open forums, screenings and a gala award. Come and experience this year's festival online. Lake International Pan-African Film Festival 6th Edition Disrupt the Narrative Okay. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, this has been the second day for LIP, and we talked about films and human rights. Until tomorrow, enjoy, and we have a virtual screening that is going to happen from 6 p.m. So do join us for the Zoom virtual screening where we have a couple of films that we're going to uh, screen and have a short conversation thereafter. Thank you. See you all tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.